Hey everyone, it's David from Streaming Relativity, home of the Astro DNA Observatory. So earlier this week, I posted a video which was titled Supernova in just 60 seconds. And wow, I'm surprised at how well that video was doing. It seems like everybody enjoyed uh, that little tour, which by the way, is playing right up above over here. But I'll also leave a, uh, a link in the description for those who want to see it independently. At any rate, in that video, I did promise that I would do a follow-up with more details on that session as well as the uh, processing workflow that I used and of course an astronomical tour of the image. Now what is the image? This is an image of the Eastern Veil Nebula and that's part of the Cygnus Loop. It's a supernova explosion and who does not love a supernova? I know I love supernovas and I'm sure you do too and if you do it's a good time to subscribe to the channel because we cover things like supernovas, galaxies, open clusters, globular clusters, uh, nebula, reflection nebula, emission nebula, uh, the moon, the sun, and all sorts of stars. We cover everything astronomy here and astrophotography, and if, if that's your interest, you should go ahead and subscribe. Okay, with that, we're going to dive into the session notes that I took for this Eastern Veil Nebula, and we'll do an, an astronomical tour, and then we'll get into the processing. Okay, so let's begin with the fact that the Eastern Veil Nebula is part of a larger DSO, deep sky object, that we call the Veil Nebula, or the Cygnus Loop. And of course, it's located in the constellation of, of Cygnus, and it's about uh, 31 degrees or so in declination. Now, that means from my location in uh, Warwick, New York, I'm at a latitude of 41 degrees, that it's not always above the horizon, but it is above the horizon for a good part of the evening. Now, the evening that I shot this target was June 27th, and I started shooting around 10 o'clock in the evening, and uh, I shot uh, all the way through, actually, 5 o'clock in the morning, but uh, the last 45 minutes or so of grabs were obviously um, uh, not good exposures because sunlight was already making its way into the sky. Now, uh, the e that evening, I did have a, um, uh, a fair amount of illumination from the moon, uh, but I was shooting narrow band, and that mitigates a lot of the moonshine. Overall, you can see from the uh, uh, the clear sky uh, chart that it was a very clear evening in terms of clouds and uh, and transparency wasn't horrific, so it was a good session. And you know, I used obviously the SVX ninety T, which is a wide field refractor, and. Um, with that, I, 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 you know, I was able to comfortably get the Eastern Veil. I do want to revisit this entire Cygnus loop and perhaps do a four-panel mosaic with this telescope, and I think that would make for a, you know, a lovely image. Um, uh, I, I shot just hydrogen alpha, O3, and sulfur, and I think the stacks came out really, really nicely. Overall, um, this was a great session, and it led to this beautiful um, uh, color composition. Okay, so let's talk about the astronomy in this image. And as I mentioned, this is the Eastern Veil Nebula. It's also known as NGC 6992. Now, it gets its name because it displays this really intricate filamentary structure with these very delicate veil-like threads of glowing gas. And these colors are simply amazing. They represent the specific wavelengths of light emitted by different elements that are found in this interstellar medium. And when I say interstellar medium, I'm talking about the space in between the stars in our galaxy. Now, the nebula is highlighted with so many vibrant colors, and th this is because the narrowband imaging techniques that we use isolate the specific wavelengths of the light emitted by these different elements in the interstellar medium. And, you know, predominantly we see green and yellow, right? So that's coming from the hydrogen the ionized higher hydrogen, the hydrogen alpha emissions. We see blue, and that's emission from ionized oxygen. And then we see some hints of red here, and in, in this case, it's maybe a little browner, but this is coming from the ionized sulfur. And those are the filters that we use when we do narrowband astrophotography. 
Now, the emissions, how are they caused? Well, they're caused by the shock waves of the supernova explosion itself. And this particular supernova happened, I don't know, between 10 and 20,000 years ago. Now, a supernova is a very powerful cosmic explosion, and it occurs at the end of a giant star's life. Now, the progenitor star responsible for this remnant was likely 20 times larger than our own sun. Now, the emissions themselves, they're occurring as the shock wave from the explosion travels through space and compresses the interstellar gas. And that compression winds up heating these elements to the point that they emit photons. And that's what we call emissions, right? So the, the, this, act, this remnant is fairly close to Earth, by the way. It's only around 1,470 years away, and it is huge. The entire Cygnus uh, loop or veil nebula is around 110 light years in diameter. We're looking at, let's say, one-third of that or one-half of that, the eastern portion. And this makes it a very popular target for astrophotographers. And as we're going to see in a minute, it's relatively easy to process. Not only is this a beautiful image, but it's a really cool subject for researchers. It's a really good target for researchers because it's providing insights to the life cycle of stars themselves. It's you know, unveiling to us the mechanisms behind these supernova explosions and how they propagate. And then finally, we know that when these supernovas happen, it's ejecting a lot of heavy elements into the surrounding cosmos. And when I say heavy elements, I'm talking about oxygen, I'm talking about carbon, and these are the building blocks of life. So with every supernova explosion, there's, there's a potential that there's new life to be formed. You have to love this image. I certainly do. And uh, why don't we spend a few minutes talking about the processing? Okay, folks, uh, this is not intended to be a tutorial on PixInsight. I'm assuming that folks at this point in the video are familiar with PixInsight and are really just interested in quickly what my workflow was. Now, my workflow is best represented on the right-hand side of the screen. This is where our we, where we typically keep our processes organized. And, and really, you know, what's important to know here is that I'm going to follow a basic align, crop, background extraction or gradient correction, and then a linear fit on the data so that my uh, sulfur, hydrogen, and oxygen signals are, are relatively um, are balanced. And, uh, and so, you know, just if anybody, you know, is, is uh, curious on how to do these things, just let me know in the comment uh, below and I'll, I'll certainly uh, cover this topic in more detail if, if requested. The net of it is, is that we, we go from a stack that has been brought in. Clearly, this is, this is the sulfur and it's, it's already been stretched. If I remove the stretch, you know, we, we see it uh, for what it is, a linear image, which is not visible. Uh, an auto stretch will make it visible. So we go from these misaligned stacks, uh, sulfur, hydrogen, oxygen, to aligned and then crop to taste, gradients removed, and, and uh, balance, signal balanced. And so our sulfur uh, looking pretty good, our hydrogen looking pretty good, stronger, obviously, than the sulfur, and our O3 uh, also strong. But clearly these are different. You know, we can see that um, uh, if we take a look at, at these guys overlapping, we can see the difference in where the signal is. So, you know, where the sulfur is, where the oxygen is. And then, of course, if we bring up the hydrogen, we can see the difference between the hydrogen and the sulfur. The hydrogen and sulfur are very close, by the way, in wavelength, but stronger hydrogen signal than, than the sulfur signal. Okay, so we've got our... Um, We've got our stacks uh, ready to go. And what I do, uh, what I did for this is, is really very simple. Some, uh, some pixel math. Uh, basically, I took the sulfur signal, assigned it to red, hydrogen to green, and um, oxygen to blue. And that, when we execute this, um, it's going to result in a, in, a, in, a, in a composite image. And of course, it's still in the linear state. But if I throw an auto stretch on that, Look at that, a fairly nice image. And all we did 
was a line crop, a little background extraction, balance the signals, do some pixel math, straight show palette, and then an auto stretch. And we've got ourselves a really nice image. So I'm going to go ahead and let me just uh, close down that process. I'm going to also clo you know, close this down because I already have this. That's here, the RGB raw. Okay. So, um, you know, just getting in there, I mean, we've got some really cool details. The filament structures are very obvious and really beautiful colors. And, uh, but what else do we have? We've got noise. Noise is normal. Noise is a part of astrophotography, and it's actually really easy nowadays to remove that noise. So what I, but what I do, what I did, for at least for this image, I have many, I do things differently, uh, you know, depending on the quality of the data and what I'm dealing with. But the very first thing that I, uh, that I did was I actually said, well, why don't I go from this raw image? So let's, let's, let's take off the stretch. And why don't we get it stretched? Let me get a stretched version of this. And, and this is a really fast and easy way to do this. And I, I did it a couple of different ways on this. I, I manually did my own stretching, but I, I really liked what the uh, auto stretch uh, produced. So uh, you, can, you can actually apply what auto stretch calculates by opening up the screen transfer function, hitting the nuke button, and then dragging that, well, let's make sure that we choose raw RGB raw as our target, okay? And we can just drag that here. If I did it right. <laughs> okay, very good. So now we drag it there. I'm going to take off the stretch here, and I'm just going to apply it here. And voila, now we have a stretched image. This is no longer in the linear state. It's in the nonlinear state. And I do that, um, um, you know, I, I, and, I, and, I, and I do that as a first step uh, with any of my narrow band work just to see what I'm dealing with. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to I'm going to bring this back to its normal state uh, I, uh, because I want to preserve the project workspace. So I'm going to close the histogram transformation. And, uh, and then I'll just throw an, uh, an auto stretch on this just to see. So this is back to linear, but I put an auto stretch on it just for viewing. Now, once I have that, I then separate the stars from the image. And that is done. I happen to use um, R uh, RC Astro has a utility. It's star, a star exterminator. There are other, there are free utilities for this as well, but I really like this. So, and it's, and, and look, I, look, don't be cheap when it comes to some of these um, uh, time saving utilities. They're really valuable, $40, $50. I, I, I highly encourage you to, you know, to purchase these things. So, at any rate, I removed the stars. And what does that do? Well, it gives me a star field and i happen to like the star field uh, i'll tell you this stellar view really generates some very sharp stars and um i separate them right away because i like their native state after the auto stretch and uh and then i do all my work uh on the on the on the on the nebula portion of it and um what we're looking at right now is uh, so the the star exterminator will create a star field for you and a starless image it'll still have all the noise and everything else and but what i did is i wound up applying to this image um uh, uh, uh if i want and i don't think i did actually but you can always do any kind of like work you want to do in terms of further refining the curves here. So, for example, and I, and I, I'm not going to do this, but if I, if I wanted to, I could, uh, for example, uh, darken up the background a bit, and maybe I want to stretch out, do a classic S curve, and bring out more of the nebula. It's getting a little contrasty for my taste, so. At any rate, you can you can do some additional stretching on the nebula portion of this, um, and apply that uh, to your image. Uh, once you have done that, you will probably want to go ahead and run some noise reduction. And um, I, I believe that I d dialed down some of the uh, the the denoise de uh, factor here to probably like eighty percent and. Uh, and the details, I think I dialed down to 15. But at any rate, you can drag and drop this process on that image. And that will eliminate all of the background noise that was originally here. And then finally, you can also um, do a little bit of blur reduction. If you like, this is like the equivalent of Unsharp Mask or um, um, 
you know, if you had stars in the image, it would be deconvolution. But basically, uh, since I'm doing all this work on starless images, I take the sharpened stars down to zero. And, um, you know, and obviously I'm applying this to luminance only. And sharpened non-stellar, you can play around with this setting. Uh, but uh, I think I left it at, uh, at its default value. And I dragged and dropped this onto my uh, starless image. And uh, let me close that. And then finally, the, uh, the final step here is to recombine stars, which I did using pixel math. Pixel math is you create a, use a single RGB expression. And what you're going to do is add your stars back to your star list image using this formula. This is very, um, uh, it's, it's well published, this formula. And the net, uh, the net result of this, by the way, is an auto stretched image uh, with the stars uh, denoised and, uh, and, and sharpened with the stars placed back, the original stars. And I actually really do like the net result of this. I think it's wonderful for, <laughs> I mean, this is, you can't get more point and click than what I just demonstrated. Look at how beautiful this is. Absolutely beautiful. By the way, um, yes, you can get, you can on your own, instead of using the screen transfer function and the auto stretch, in fact, you should probably, you know, really invest the time to create your own. I did that as well. And, and in the end, the result to me was, uh, you know, did I, do I feel like I achieved something more uh, compelling on my own? Actually, no, I actually... <laughs> I actually think that the auto stretch did a better job. That might speak to my stretching skills, or it might just speak to um, the uh, you know a unique quality to this data and the settings, the default settings for the auto stretch that just happened to really work out well. But this is also not an image to um, be ashamed of. I, I just love, I just love this detail. What a gorgeous image, and what an easy object uh, or data set to process with Pix Insight. All right, that's all I wanted to share. All right, folks, let's call that a wrap. I hope you enjoyed watching this video as much as I enjoyed making it. And if you did, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, leave me a comment, share the channel with your friends. All of it is good. It keeps me going and it keeps you notified when new content is released. Speaking of new content, I have couple videos coming up that deal with lions in space and you don't want to miss that uh I'll, I'll i'll give you i'll give you a little glimpse right now that's the lion nebula at any rate thanks so much for watching and i will see you all on the next video